Hello, everyone, and welcome to Orthodoxy. My name is Andy Schmidt, and we're back with another podcast. Uh, today, I got to talk with two people that have been on this podcast before. So Dr. David Devil, he is uh, new chair. He's a chair of theology at University of St. Thomas in Houston. He was on this podcast uh, before he debated Nick a little bit, uh, a couple of years ago, maybe, maybe a year and a half ago on Catholicism versus Protestantism. And then we also did a podcast a little while ago about G.K. Chesterton um, in kind of a short series that I did on great theologians. Um, so Dr. David Devil, and then another guy that's been on this podcast, Austin Freeman, Dr. Austin Freeman from Houston Christian University in Houston, Texas. Uh, he is the chair of the Department of Apologetics. He uh, got his PhD from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and um, super cool guy. We did a podcast on his book, Tolkien Dogmatics. He wrote a systematic theology on Middle Earth, which was one of the coolest books that's come out uh, this year. Uh, very, very interesting uh, book. And so this podcast, we uh, we talked about G.K. Chesterton's two books that that are uh, one of them very popular, the one the other one not many people know about. Uh, the first one was Heretics, um, and this book Heretics is kind of what led Chesterton into writing his more popular book Orthodoxy. And so uh, we talk about Heretics and Orthodoxy. It's a kind of a wide ranging conversation, um, and and we discuss some of the themes throughout both of those books. But then uh, at the end, we we discuss how G.K. Chesterton would actually maybe interact with the culture that we live in today um, through the lens of orthodoxy and heretics. And, and um, it was an interesting conversation. Talked a little bit about Catholicism and why Chesterton moved from Anglican, Anglo-Catholic to uh, full-on Catholicism. And uh, it, was, it was a fun conversation. Both these guys know a lot about Chesterton. Um, I would consider them to be G.K. Chesterton experts. I'm not sure. If, if they would, but they're absolutely uh, fantastic guests to have. Now, I will warn you, I'm, I'm going to try to edit this all and it'll hopefully sound really good. But while we were recording, we had a ton of different um, technical difficulties, Wi-Fi not working, computers not working, things like that. And so it's kind of chopped up um, and, and I think I'll be able to make it sound good. But then uh, we didn't get the the video. We, we only have uh, the audio um, for for part for the majority of it. And so um, if you're if you're watching on YouTube, usually we have the video on this one. We won't have the video, but you can still uh, listen to it on YouTube and on Spotify. And so uh, anyways, yeah, fantastic conversation on heretics and orthodoxy with uh, Dr. David Devil and Austin, Dr. Austin Freeman uh, and on GK Chesterton, uh, the the one of the most interesting Christian figures of the past 100 years. Um, super excited uh, for you to listen to this. So I hope you enjoy. Okay, cool. Well, I'm here with Austin Freeman and David Devil. This is going to be a fun conversation. We're talking about G.K. Chesterton and orthodoxy and heretics, and um, uh, and I'm sure it'll be a wide ranging conversation. But um, before we get into Chesterton's most known book, Orthodoxy, uh, he mentions in the introduction to that book uh, another book that he wrote previously. To, previous to that is Heretics, and and not many people know anything about that book. I don't know much about that book. So David, uh, you want to begin by just explaining what the the book Heretics is about, and then we can kind of transition into talking about orthodoxy. Yeah. So Heretics was published about three years before Orthodoxy, his most famous book. And it really came out of his, uh, his debates with a guy named Robert Blatchford, who was an editor of a magazine called The Clarion. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, Chester had been a big fan of, of Blatchford in the 1890s when he was younger. Chester was born in 1874. So it was sort of uh, late teens, early 20s. He was a big fan of, uh, of Blatchford. But he began to, as he said, at some point in the 1890s, he was he, he felt like he was going Orthodox. Um, and he didn't mean Eastern Orthodox, but just Orthodox Christianity. Hmm. Um, and so by uh, by 1905, he had uh, had a number of debates 
with Blatchford in the pages of the Clarion. Uh, Blatchford had invited him to contribute to a series on uh, what he ended up publishing as a book called Religious Religious Doubts and Democracy or something like that. Mm-hmm. But Chesterton was already defending uh, Orthodox Christianity in those in those pieces. And he'd been criticizing a lot of public figures like George Bernard Shaw, uh, Joseph McCabe, a former Catholic priest who'd become a kind of uh, a rationalist figure, kind of, you know, atheist, new atheist type. Um, uh, H.G. Wells, another friend of his, he'd been criticizing a lot of them. And so that's what his book is about. Uh, he begins uh, by talking about the fact that uh, the, the sort of the coolest thing that everybody thinks is that you can have <clears throat> you can have straight orthodox views about some particular topic. But once you start talking about a view of the world, people go, whoa, whoa, that's that's really bad. It's much better to be a, a heretic about the world than to have a view. And mm-hmm. he says that's you know, that's really the wrong way to look look at it. And so then that begins his sort of series of critiques of all of these different people and shows why they're all taking, they're basically looking through the wrong end of the, uh, the telescope at various mm-hmm. topics. And he takes on sort of forgotten, uh, you know, poetic figures like Omar Khayyam, as well as McCabe and, and Wells and these sort of people. And what's remarkable about it is that he is so good at saying that people uh, have virtues uh, and he wants to identify what their real problem is. He, he says about his friend, uh, George Bernard Shaw, you know, the thing is, this guy, he applies his standards to everybody. He is, there's no double dealing. Problem is, all of his standards are wrong. Um, so this was kind of a hit book, uh, and it uh, spurred Blatchford, uh, to whom he'd kind of written it, to say, well, all right, fine. You've, criti- you've criticized everybody uh, about being a heretic now you need to say what's orthodox. And so in 1908, then that's when orthodoxy came out. It was sort of out. That's why he mentions at the, at the beginning of orthodoxies, he basically, he double dog dared Chesterton. Chesterton said, all right, I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Didn't they say in the beginning, like, you don't need to, you don't need to convince me to write a book on, on my, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. that's okay. So this is interesting though, because Chesterton seems to, well, he goes after people in, in heretics, like you're saying, and that is off putting for I think the modern reader in our age of, of passivity and you know your view is your view my view is my view even in the Christian church I'm sure that you're seeing it in Catholicism and, and seeing it all over Protestantism um so so Austin is there is this book heretics is there is this indicative of any sort of personality trait of Chesterton I know this might be a, a weird question but that he first goes after your uh, your opinions, he calls you wrong, and then later on gives his opinions. Is that indicative of, of any sort of Chesterton sort of uh, personality traits? Um, it, insofar as this is a sort of macrocosmic view of what he does in a very much smaller way, Chesterton loves toppling sacred cows. Um, and so he will present the thing which seems to be the, the common <laughs> wisdom of the day, the things that everybody takes for granted. And he says, well, actually, if you think about it, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, So in in that sense, this is what he's doing at a very large scale. He's setting up, this is what everybody thinks. And then he says, but actually, it's exactly the opposite. Um, So for instance, Mm -hmm. he talks about in Heretics, the absolute lunacy of trying to establish that everybody should go out for progress when we haven't even defined what our terms mean. Um, so he's got this passage where he says, the, let's let's say that there are a bunch of people standing around um, and debating over whether you should pull down this particular lamppost. Uh, and then the, the medieval monk comes up and he says, first, let us talk about the nature of light. And light in itself is desirable. And they all say, oh, shut up. We don't need any of that. Um, and so then they pull the lamppost down, but it turns out that none of them uh, that were pulling down the lamppost had a common vision for what should go up in its place. Some of them want a more modern lamppost to replace it with electricity instead of gas. Some of them, he says, wanted there to be darkness because their deeds were evil. Some of them wanted to relocate the lamppost into a new place. Uh, and so they end up having a debate in the darkness when they could have just listened to the guy that tries to start from first principles um, and uh, been having a debate by uh, mm-hmm. lamplight. And he sort of says, this is what progress is. This Mm -hmm. is what our culture is currently doing. And he's writing at the the tail end of the Victorian era and on into the Edwardian period. Um, This is in the midst of the Industrial Revolution. This is in the midst of uh, a a huge sea change in the way that society was being run. 
Um, and you have all of these Victorian sages that are trying to, uh, to come out with new ways of looking at the world and these grand systems with a capital S. Uh, and so Chesterton is, is much more interested in poking holes uh, in the people that are taking themselves too seriously. Uh, as he says in Orthodoxy, um, uh, okay, not so only are this angels, is interesting. Uh, go ahead. I was just going to say he makes a joke about angels practicing levitation, but also levity because they don't take themselves so seriously. Well, this kind of leads into that next book, Orthodoxy. So we kind of have a general overview of uh, what heretics is about. But Austin, do you want to kind of give an overview and explain what the kind of key themes are in Orthodoxy? Uh, Orthodoxy is really in a lot of ways Chesterton's spiritual autobiography. Uh, and it's, he's picking up in the tradition of other Victorian converts like John Henry Newman. But he is recording in a fairly unsystematic way the result of the multiple impressions that he's getting uh, of, of trying to invent his own heresy, uh, trying to create his own idiosyncratic religious belief and finding every time that he's settled down on what he thinks uh, – the world is like finding that orthodoxy got there before him. Uh, and when that happens enough times, you realize, well, maybe there's something in it. And so he decides to, mm -hmm. to convert to orthodox Christianity. He gives this analogy of the fact that the world is pretty regular, but not completely regular. So if you think that a, a, a human being can be divided down the middle, we have two arms and two legs and two nostrils and two hemispheres of the brain and two lungs, and on and on it goes, um, you would think that perhaps the heart would be in the middle or that maybe you would have two hearts, but you don't. You only have one heart and it's on the left side. <laughs> and so he finds that orthodoxy is something like that. It is able to describe both the things that everybody in human history have held in common and also some of the really unique things that uh, most people have gotten wrong. And so he says that uh, orthodoxy is uh, a, a romance because it is like balancing on a tightrope. Uh, it's hmm. trying to it's trying to balance these two huge extremes in life uh, and, and to thread that needle. Um, and so he finds that a, a, as he's trying to do it, it seems like he could have spared himself a lot of effort just by listening to what Christianity had been teaching all along. Um, and so it's not really an apologetic argument in the traditional sense. He's not giving syllogisms or anything like that. Uh, he's giving his own impressions of what he thought the world must be like. So for instance, he felt like the world uh, ought to be responded to with a sense of gratitude. Um, and yet it makes a lot of sense to think that if we ought to respond with gratitude, it's because the world is a gift. Well, who gave it then? Uh, and so there's these mounting sorts of considerations that he has in his own processing of um, his impression of existence. And it leads him to Christianity as basically the religion of common sense. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, well, that, that is an interesting, uh, that it leads into the religion, that the idea that really, Christianity is a religion of common sense. The One of the things that he talks about first is the maniac, which I think this section is interesting. Um, and I'm interested in, David, can you kind of explain what he talks about when he discusses the maniac? Because he, he it feels like at some point he kind of goes after uh, uh, Calvinists, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit. But David, can you can you explain the maniac? Yeah, I mean, contrary to what a lot of people, you know, would say in a kind of rational, uh, you know, post Enlightenment age, Chesterton doesn't think that mm -hmm. it's it's uh, you know being unreasonable that causes people to go wrong. He says that the maniac is the person uh, who's lost everything but his reason. And you might yeah. think about perhaps like a conspiracy theorist, right? I mean, mm -hmm. they're certainly reasonable. Uh, they, they can use logic. It's just that everything around them is is the wrong kind of perception. So he's actually challenging uh, people to actually see how reason itself depends upon something that's deeper than reason. And for him, you know, he points out that it's poetry that makes us sane, uh, you know, not reason. Uh, uh, so, you know, again, it's not it's not a denunciation of, of reason, but it is a denunciation of what he calls the, uh, the clean and well lit prison of one idea of people who think they can can reduce reality to one thing. Uh, for him, uh, reality has to be seen in all of its glorious oddity, 
uh, as Austin said, you know, with the human body, it 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 looks normal, but it's it, if you open it up a little bit, you realize that there are all sorts of oddities about it. And if you're not aware of that and not open to that greater sense of reality, uh, you'll be using you'll be reasonable in a sense, but you'll also drive yourself mad because you mm-hmm. won't see exactly what what is strange and wonderful and and what what can be fit uh, by the key of of Christian truth. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I think the, um, well, I, I recently watched, I think it just came out, the Jordan Peterson talking with Richard Dawkins uh, sure. podcast. Did, you, did either of you guys listen to that? I spared myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, Dawkins seems to be, yeah, obviously he's kind of this, uh, you know, if it's not provable in test tubes, then it's, it doesn't matter at all. And it's very difficult to listen to him. It, it, it seems like um, in some ways, as you're discussing and ex- describing the uh, the maniac, I, I, maybe I would put Dawkins in that in that category in the modern times. Would you guys agree with that assessment or am I am I going too far there? I think that's right. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, why? So, OK. So. Would you agree, Austin, that Chesterton is, goes after a little bit the sort of Calvinist attitude here in this section? And oh, if there are so, a lot of things of Calvinism, yeah. Okay, so can you explain some of that? And and maybe uh, I assume your background is that you would be in the Calvinist camp. Maybe not. If I'm showing I would, that wrong, yes. you would. Okay, so explain him going after Calvinism, and then explain if there's any validity to his um, frustrations with it. Uh, well, when Chesterton says Calvinism, he pretty much means determinism. Uh, in other sure. words, he means the denial of human free will, which mm-hmm. is, of course, not what Calvinism teaches. There's no Calvinist that denies humans have free will. Um, but it seems as if Chesterton is an incompatibilist. That is, he means to say that you have to choose between free will and determinism. They cannot mm-hmm. coexist. Um and uh, Calvinists are compatibilists. They believe that those can be true at the same time. Uh, so I would say to Chesterton exactly what he says at the end of Orthodoxy about free thinkers and other people, that uh, the Calvinist seems to be the person that, that can have it both ways and is free to, um, free to consider all options, whereas Chesterton seems to be a little dogmatic in excluding one of those poles. Um, but of course, he's, he's doing that because of the doctrine that he's chosen to subscribe to. Um, he, he's not a Calvinist. He did not become a, a Protestant. And so he's going to uphold the understanding of human freedom of the of the party to which he has sworn allegiance. And he is very patriotic to his causes, as we have seen. Mm-hmm. Um, but when he says Calvinism, I'm not I'm not certain that Chesterton has any real firm understanding of what Calvinism actually teaches. Um, in shorthand, he says Calvin and he means uh, absolute fatalism, which, of mm-hmm. course, Calvin would have rejected. Okay, so I'm not trying to pit you, pit you guys up against each other, but I am interested in hearing, David, what, what do you think about what Austin just said? And do you think that Chesterton did have an, uh, a proper understanding of Calvinism? Well, I mean, I grew up I grew up in the Calvinist tradition for, for a good bit. And so, I mean, I think that Austin is correct that there are different hmm. different ways of understanding uh, Calvin uh, and, and that whole tradition. Uh, I don't. I, I myself don't have quite the hostility that Chesterton did because I grew up in it and saw that sure. there was a healthy appreciation uh, for, uh, you know, for free will we, even within Calvinist uh, lands. Um, uh, and I saw lots of uh, continuity between the Calvinist tradition and the Catholic tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, so, did did Chesterton understand Calvinism fully? Um, pro- probably not. I mean, and as Austin says, when he became Christian, he did not become a Christian within that Calvinist tradition. Instead, he became a Christian amidst the Anglican Church, uh, the Church of England, and a very particularly Catholic version of it. By 1908, he's not a, a, he's not in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, he's an Anglican still, but an Anglican of a very particular Catholic variety. Sure. Um, you'd have to you'd have to kind of look at you know granularly at at what he says about these things and what different kinds of you know Calvinists there are to to say whether he's he's hitting the the whole thing accurately or not. Uh, hmm. I mean, in my in my circles, there were some groups that didn't believe in any sort of evangelization uh, because <laughs> if God meant you to get it, you'd get it somehow. Uh, sure. <laughs> that's not all Calvinists, but it, it's certainly some. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, there's a quote, um, and, and I guess I'm moving on a little bit, but there's, there's a quote here uh, from the book that says, but the cross, though it, it, it has at its heart a collision and a contradiction, can extend its forearms forever without altering its shape. Because it has a paradox at its center, it can grow without changing. It's obviously one of the more popular quotes from this book and uh, one of my favorite ones. Um <clears throat> What exactly is Chesterton talking about here, Austin, uh, that there's a there's a paradox at the center of the cross? Well, there's a paradox at the center of all of Christianity. I mean, God is is one being in three persons. Christ is uh, truly God and truly man. The the kingdom of God is already and not yet. Uh, Mm -hmm. Human beings are both free and under the will of God. Uh, You can find a paradox everywhere. Uh, That was actually the subject of my dissertation. But the point that he's making is there are different forms of infinity because in contrast to the cross, he sets up the circle uh, and he talks specifically about Eastern religions here. Um, You can have a very small cramped infinity. A small circle is just as infinite as a large one. Um, It just goes round and round and round in a very small spot. Um, But he says the, the cross is infinite in a much more expansive sense because it has the The collision there at the center, the collision of God with the universe, the collision of finite, limited human beings with the disclosure, the revelation that God has in Christ. Uh, And when you have that one central mystery of of God become man, it actually opens up um, the rest of the world to be understandable. Uh, Mm -hmm. And you don't have the monomania of the one single idea uh, that that idea that we were talking about earlier, the maniac is the person that lives within that circle. And in a sense, it's infinite. But uh, as he will say to one of the maniacs that believes that they're the Messiah, well, it must be a very sad world if you're the greatest thing um, Mm -hmm. in it. Uh, he, He picks up the same idea in Heretics, that uh, if you have a a conflict between the telescopists and the microscopists, uh, that it's actually a lot more pleasing to live in a world where there's something bigger than you, um, than to be the biggest thing in it and therefore be bored by everything. Um, and so that's kind of what he's talking about is once you admit that central fact of, of the mystery that God is not the world, uh, and that human beings are finite and subject to this much greater mystery, then he says, he, he uses this analogy that it was like a key to a lock and everything else fell into place. And that's when Christianity began to make sense. Um, you accept one contradiction and you find clarity everywhere else. Uh, other people try to start with one particular form of absolute logical clarity and they end up not being able to explain anything. Hmm. Hmm. I'm interested in what you guys think about this because I've been trying to, to to figure this out lately as our culture has seemed to get weirder and weirder in certain ways. But also, um, well, Austin, you just mentioned that the, the circular mindset uh, kind of it, it's this idea that I'm the only I'm the biggest thing in this world and therefore I'm the only interesting thing in this world. But then you said you become bored of that that sort of ideology. Um, do you feel like if we kind of, uh, extract that out to, to the culture at large and maybe the United States or in the West in general, um, do you think that we're at the beginning of that cycle in the sense that, um, we've, we've kind of, you know, there's a quote that the God is dead quote. So in society, the God is, um, we've kind of gotten rid of the idea of God and we've made ourselves the most interesting, uh, and, and the most important thing in the world, our our individual self. Um, are we at the beginning of the cycle of we're just exploring how interesting we are or are we at the end of the cycle of, okay, we have told ourselves for decades that we're the most important thing that exists. Um, like this is kind of run, run its course. And now we're coming to the end of it. And people are saying, well, maybe we do need a God. I, I don't know exactly where we are in that progression. Uh, I, I'm interested in what both of you have to say about that. So, um, I mean, maybe we'll start with David. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, he, 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 one of his chapters is the suicide of thought. And, uh, hmm. you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're at a point in particularly in most of the world where we're at a, a sort of a literal suicide, sure. uh, not just, not just that most of the world is not replacing, you know, having a replacement mm-hmm. level number of babies, but, you know, if you follow any of the things in the, in the Western world, particularly Canada's, uh, made program, their assistance in dying, the, the low countries, uh, you know, people have put, put, you know, the human, human reality at the center 
it's a false god, and now they want to destroy it. And it's connected to transhumanism. It's yeah. you know, transgenderism is just to me like a sort of a you know a pious sect of transhumanism that mm-hmm. will eventually blend back into it. And that that I think is is what he was seeing in England even in his own time. Uh, you know, you read any of his columns. You know, there are people. There were people that were talking about the dissolution of the family, dissolute. You know, this notion of getting rid of of what it means to be human. Um, so, you know, I, I think we're at that point where you know we're, what we're what we're at, and he talks about this in in Heretics is, uh, you know, the the idea of a new paganism, and it's not the old paganism. It's and in fact, it's a, it's a refusal to go ahead and it's a rejection of Christianity as well. And hmm. so I think that's what we're seeing is that the older rationalism is, is dying and dead. And hmm. what's filling it is something that's, it, that's unnatural rather than uh, purely natural. So I, you know, I think Chesterton would say we, we, we really only have one way to go and that's, that's towards God. And if we don't, we're going to go towards demons. Uh, sure. So I think that's what we're, that's what we're seeing with all of the strangeness. And so at what point I can't, I don't remember if you said specifically, do you think we're at the, we're, because one of the things that I'm thinking of is, okay, so transhumanism obviously is a next, next step from transgenderism to transhumanism. Um, and that requires certain technological innovation and progress. And a lot of our technological innovation and progress has come from, uh, the sort of Christian worldview, this, uh, you know, C- Christianity kind of uh, enhanced science over the past 500 years and, and technology and, uh, and things like that. And so will, will the, you know, desolation of Christianity then stop us before we get to the transhuman part <laughs> or will we get to the transhuman part first? It's kind of a weird race. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, what, what yeah. do you think comes first? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, I guess it do, what, depends on how close you think we are to the second coming, perhaps. Um, <laughs> you know, that mm-hmm. it, it is a good question because, uh, you know, we are stopping in many ways. And people have talked about that. Our progress is very much limited by by our horizon these days. And so will we get there? Maybe not. But what, you know, the, the amount of damage that we do in the in the meantime is is kind of extraordinary. But again, it's not it's not unheard of. And indeed, if you read something else of Chesterton's The Everlasting Man, he he contrasts, you know, his view of the world with with that of H.G. Wells, who had adopted the view that, you know, the sort of the Enlightenment view that we things start out very primitively and there's a constant progress you know, it's a it's a line that's going up. You know, from the bottom left to the right, you know, right top of the of the chart. And he says, no, hmm. the history of human beings is that uh, you know we build towers of Babel, <laughs> they are destroyed. <laughs> we destroy ourselves. Um, you know that that that's the history of the world. Even after even after Christ has come, that's that's kind of what we do. It might be that. Uh, the towers of Babel we can build now are higher, but that means they fall over harder. Mm, that makes sense. Yeah, it just feels like there's uh, the 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 um, yeah. I, I guess what you're saying, <laughs> they're getting more. Uh, I don't want to say advanced, just more technologically advanced in that sense. I mean, the Tower of Babel was evil, and transhumanism is evil, um, and and yet it feels like the issue of today is that there's this this widespread sort of if if we do something um if transhumanism develops like in california it's going to be really quick uh from the time of its development to the time of its spread all over the world which you know a thousand two thousand years ago that just wouldn't have happened so quickly so um the spread of the things are are happening at rates that we've never seen before austin Mm -hmm. um you were you were going in. You were saying something, and then you cut out. Do you do you want to continue that thought? Uh, I do think that we're at the end of this cycle, um, and I don't think that it's a sort of one-off movement. I do think that it's probably almost a pendulum uh, that we will swing back and forth from. 
because I, as Chesterton says in Orthodoxy, religion is the natural state of human beings. And we're going to find across cultures and across times that people are going to pretty much follow the same pattern in terms of having priests and sacred books and uh, mysteries and all sorts of things. Uh, the difference is only in what the content is. So I think that we tried for a very long time to create a godless form of religion and we still had our priests and our sacred books and we called them, you know, scientists and uh, we, we changed the terminology, but the function remained the same. Uh, but we closed ourselves off from the san sane aspect of the universe that Chesterton is so uh at pains to emphasize and realize that we had kind of turned ourselves into men without chests to borrow a, a C.S. Lewis phrase. Uh, and you just can't live in that sort of universe and people rejected it. And so the rationalism of the 1700s, the 1800s, uh, really started to die out and we're entering into this new form of mysticism. But as Chesterton remarked, uh, when people stop believing in Christianity, it's not that they will believe in nothing, it's that they'll believe in anything. Uh, and so we found a, an almost, to, to our view, absurd level of uh, credibility given to things like neo-paganism uh, and crystals and auras and all sorts of uh, UFO cults, things that we would deem to be pretty wacky. Um, and yet people see them as filling a spiritual need in their lives because whatever rationalism was, it was not satisfying the the cravings of the human heart. And so... Yeah, the, the idea that we're moving away from religion altogether is demonstrably false. I mean, people are more religious nowadays than they are. Uh, it, it's surprising that Richard Dawkins is even still in the mix, interviewing Jordan Peterson or whatever. It seems like new atheism is long dead. Uh, we're, we're in the age of the shaman, not the age of the, the new atheist. You know, there's whole bookshelves at Barnes & Noble that are devoted to these sorts of beliefs. Um, but it's it's interesting how far we'll go along this line. Chesterton uh, highlights the sort of misunderstanding that a lot of people have with what paganism was actually like in orthodoxy. Um, this is in the passage where he's talking about how any stick is good to beat Christianity with, uh, that some people are accusing Christianity of dulling the world and taking away all of the fairies and sprites and the joys of the woodlands when you think all the gods are everywhere. And then uh, other people are trying to think that Christianity is ridiculous and it's full of old wives' tales for, for old women. But I mean, paganism was a fairly, fairly scary thing. Uh, and it did have a lot of ridiculous aspects to it. Uh, and Chesterton is a good enough classicist to know that. And he sees a lot of parallel with the, the credibility that people are giving to these sorts of claims, even in his time. Remember, I mean, Chesterton is writing during the, the rise and the spread of spiritualism um, and table tapping and ectoplasm and all this other stuff. That's exactly the time that he's writing. Um, Kardec, who's huge in Brazil. There's people that are still in at the height of the industrial revolution um, at the same time that H.G. Wells is writing about, you know, uh, rationalism in its purest form. Then you also have people talking about um, mediums and seances. It's the same culture. Um, so I, I think in the United States, at least, we're at the end of this uh, cycle um, and moving back into the mystical pole. But as Chesterton would say, uh, you don't have to choose one or the other. Christianity will give you both at the same time. Well, yeah, I think that leads into kind of one of the next questions that I have and that I've, I've been trying to think about, especially as I listen to really last night was listening to the Dawkins Peterson, who, who seemed to be sort of forefronts of, of polar opposites in, in one sense, you know, the hyper rationalist and then and then Jordan Peterson, like everything's allegorical in some capacity. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what in the world is going on? So uh, what? how do you in how do you find even as a Christian, the proper proportion of either of those two things? I see like, obviously there's a spectrum of Christian denominations and, mm -hmm. and convictions and everybody's saying, claiming that they've done, they found the right proportion of each of them. Um, maybe, you know, David, I'm interested in hearing from the Catholic perspective. There's yeah. a spectrum within Catholicism. What, what, what is this? How do you, how do you do that? How do you find the right sort of Christian conviction? That's like the bit, the golden, you know, ticket question, but yeah, well, I want to hear your thoughts. 
Uh, you know, one thing Austin mentioned that, you know, Chesterton doesn't write this in a sort of syllogistic apologetic fashion or a kind of strictly rational one. He, he indeed calls it a kind of slovenly autobiography in which he he gives in a series of images and pictures what he believes. And he, his his case is actually made in the way that somebody like John Henry Newman in the 19th century made a case that is using a sort of cumulative method. Um, it's almost like a... Uh, you know, you, you have to see the whole picture. He paints a vision for you and says, which is more believable? And that's the way that Chesterton approached uh, Christianity as well, is that, well, where is the church? And for him, ultimately, he ended up not in 1908, but by 1922, becoming a Catholic, uh, in part because as an Anglican, he said, "You know, I'm allowed to. Uh, I'm allowed to to uh, have a veneration for the for the Blessed Virgin Mary. I'm allowed to have a crucifix, but I'd rather have a religion where that's a normal part of it." So he he tended to look at all different aspects of it and see which provided the which provided the most uh, the most believable and and the most uh, sincere and and truthful vision of what was out there. And he judged that that was. Catholic faith, with it, without without disdaining those who who did not, uh, you know, who were still Protestant. I mean, he would take the jabs at at Calvinists, particularly, and occasion and Methodists as well, uh, and some of these other groups. But he did he did have a great uh, affection for any who professed Christ. But for him, uh, when you saw the vision, uh, it, it matched up to to the Catholic vision, even despite mm-hmm. all of the problems with. With ordinary Catholics uh, and even even Catholic prelates and and even uh, bad bad popes and the, and the whole bit. Hmm. So, what was it about? What was it about Mary? Because that doesn't I, I obviously Protestant, but that is the one thing in Catholicism that makes no sense. It seems the most irra- irrational to me. So, the veneration of Mary and the way in which the Catholics interact with Mary and pray to Mary, that, that doesn't seem to, to be based in anything that I can see in, in scripture or in nature. And so w- David, what, what is, what does he find then in that, in his moving from Anglicanism or Anglo Catholic to full on Catholic? Yeah. Well, he, I mean, for him, he, uh, he, he had an attraction to Mary even sort of, even before he had become fully Orthodox and he saw uh, Mary as as an image of both purity, not not just sort of sexual purity, the, although that's part of it, but it's a purity of intention that she's the one who says when she is given the message by the angel Gabriel, uh, you know, let it be done unto me according to thy word. Sure. Um, so for her, she is the perfect for for Chesterton. She is an image of sort of the perfect purity who receives the savior. And she's the first one to receive the good news. And when she goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth uh, and delivers her great, great song, the Magnificat, she says, all generations will call me blessed. Um, mm-hmm. So there's, a, there's, you know, for that, Chesterton thought that was very biblical. And so too, the fact that uh, as the first of the redeemed, if you will, um, she is the first one to receive uh, that fullness of the Holy Spirit's blessing. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, you become uh, like Christ. I mean, that's what to be a Christian is, is to be a little Christ. And Mm -hmm. to be a little Christ is to be admirable and indeed venerable um, in a way. And so that, that, you know, for Chesterton, that was was not uh, unnatural or unbiblical at all, but it followed from the biblical logic that um, if we become like Christ, uh, then particularly when we die, uh, and we go to be with Christ, then we are we share in that fullness, and we become uh, you know a person to whom uh, others reach out, and we are there under the altar crying out to the Lord and offering up those prayers. Hmm. Uh, so to, to Chesterton and to the Catholic mind, uh, there's nothing there's nothing odd about the idea that we would um, ask those you know those saints who've hmm. gone before us and who have become perfected. Uh, that they would offer their prayers, because as the epistle to James says, the prayer of a righteous man is very effective. And who's more who's more righteous than those who have been perfected in heaven? Well, uh, the Protestant answer would be uh, Jesus, but that that's the, I, I don't want to, you already, hold David, on, you already hold did. On, hold on, hold on, Andy. Now, wait a minute. Do, do, okay. do you ask, hold on. 
But we're yeah. not talking about Christ. We're talking about ordinary. Do you ask other friends to pray for you? Sure. I ask them to pray for me, but I don't pray to them. It, I mean, and I would, I'm I mean, interested in this. We're, we're kind of punting on the terminology here because what, what, what do you mean pray to? Well, I mean, pray to for um, intercessory, you know? So like I, I think of the Hebrews uh, verse that talks about Christ being our high priest and he, him being our intercessor between God and us. And I don't see that in any, uh, in relationship to any other character in scripture, I, I see there being, you know, and if we talk about veneration as having a deep, uh, you know, sort of uh, appreciation of the saints, I think that we should have that sort of appreciation. But I don't think that that appreciation should then um, become equal to Christ, because even though. Uh, like you're saying, we become little Christ or we become like Christ when we're fully glorified in heaven. We don't become Christ. We're still, we're still in the image. We're still shadows of Christ. And, 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 and so I, I'm interested in this. So what, what do you think about that? And Austin, feel free to step in, you know, where I'm probably lacking. <clears throat> oh, yeah, I have well. Go ahead, Austin. <laughs> um, so Chesterton, what does Chesterton find in Mary? I think, Chesterton is very interested in the complementarity between the sexes. Um, he, he's a person that is r actually writing about sex a good bit, um, which is pretty unusual for people that uh, are coming into him blind. And so I think what Chesterton sees in Mary is this archetype of the feminine. Um, and so he sees this mutuality between male and female and that there is a place for it in the Christian tradition. And so he sees uh, God as male in Christ um, and that Mary is the the not the divine feminine as you would have it in Eastern religion. That's one of those areas in which the universe isn't quite what we would expect it to be. Um, but Mary is the, the principle of femininity um, in this archetypal fashion that she is the one that says yes and receives. Uh, she, she receives God. She receives the blessing. Um, and so he sees Mary as uh, fulfilling a, a psychological need that's part of human nature. Um, as being a representative of half of the human race uh, in terms of like finding a role within the plan of redemption. Um, and then I think he also sees Mary as uh, an archetype of the Christian, right? She's called the mother of the, of the church because she is the, the first one that says yes to Christ. And so she becomes a model for everybody else. Uh, so he sees in Mary, uh, I think, this... Um, paradigm uh, of what it means to be a Christian uh, and sees alongside that this fondness and loyalty uh, and uh, pure familial affection uh, towards the mom, right? This is Mary is, is everybody's mom. Um, and so he sees this reverence, this uh, respect, and this fierce loyalty uh, in defending your family. Like man, Mary is the, the head of the family of the church. In, she's not the head. Christ is the head. But, um, but, but she is, is part of that family structure, and he's going to defend her. Hmm. I, okay, so I can see two things here, and I'm fine with going off a little bit off of the, the orthodoxy thing here, because I think this is an important thing and something that a lot of people are talking about and trying to figure out. Um, two things. One is, I, uh, and I'm interested, David, I want to hear your thoughts on this, because um, – <clears throat> Austin, you kind of said that uh, Mary is the archety archetypal, maybe woman figure in the scriptures. And I think may maybe so. Uh, that's Chesterton's view. That's maybe the Catholic view. Maybe that's so. But um, if, if you know, God is man and Christ comes down as man and then and then and then we can look to Christ as, as mm -hmm. men, maybe in a different way that women can look to Christ. Sure, that, that might be true. But it says in Genesis, and this is one of the things I get caught up in is that the God, you know, they say, let us make them in our image. Um, both male and female are made in the image of God. And so even though Christ comes down and takes on the form of man uh, and his masculinity is essential to his purpose on earth, there is some sense in that the, the nature of God is both masculine and feminine. And so there is a way in which women then shouldn't create those sorts of distinctions. Um, David, what do you think about that? I'm, st I'm just saying things right now. I'm trying to figure this out a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, you know, the thing is, is that Christ has all perfections in him, both 
both the masculine virtues and the feminine virtues. I mean, you know, nowadays, unfortunately, you say that and people will go off on sort of a trans tangent that, you know, <laughs> okay, that, yeah, yeah. and that's, and that's, that's not what we mean, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but certainly Christ has all of those things, but there, there is a sense in which Christ is the redeemer. And so he's fully perfectly man, but he's not, he's not one of the redeemed and Mary is one of the redeemed. And that's, that's uh, that's the difference, I would say. Um, and in some sense, I mean, her her being a woman is is perfect for that, because there is a kind of natural symbolism uh, there that all of us are, in some sense, feminine before God, that, uh, you know, sort of masculine action um you know, is, is, is sort of a predicate of God. We call God he, not because God is a dude or something like that, mm. uh, but because that's the way he reveals himself to us. Uh, and sure. we, we ourselves are part of the human race. Chesterton says, you know, men will be men, but man is a woman. And what he means is, is that notion that humanity is in some sense feminine before God, right? It's, it's always the bride of Christ. It is the, mm -hmm. the bride of the bride of God in the Old Testament, uh, that sort of thing. So that's where Mary's symbolism is is important. As Austin says, she's she's seen as the mother of the church. She's seen as the mother of all Christians uh, because she is the first one to receive that gospel and and to rejoice in it. And she most perfectly uh goes through all of these things with her son. Um, she is the one who is present, you know, from basically from the, from the womb to the tomb, uh, she is there <laughs> under the cross. And so that's, that's partly why Chesterton sees, sees her as, as a remarkable figure and is not afraid to say, yeah, I want to, I want to be like Mary in that sense. But the reason why Mary is so important is that she, she wants to be like her son. She wants to do what God, God says. Hmm. Chesterton's also very concerned with the idea of chivalry. And so based on this idea of chivalry and the the service of the feminine, the protection of the feminine, um, whatever these uh, knights and heroes are doing, um, I think he finds in Mary a way of sanctifying that impulse, um, not just for Mary, but for his, his wife as well, um, which he's... Uh, very loyal to and very fond of. Mm -hmm. um, but this is just a, a way of him bringing his religion into, into that realm um, of uh, having a lady, right? There's, because the, the difference is you are supposed to be the, the leader of your wife, but uh, your, your lady uh, is supposed to be leading you or, or um, commissioning you in a way. So um, Mary is both a female and his superior. Uh, I think that's something also that appeals to his chivalric medieval impulse. Hmm. Hmm. No, this is that, that that's interesting, and I, I th thank you, David, for for uh, making sure that I didn't sound like I was making like a transgender argument. Obviously, I don't want to do that. Um, but but I think that, and that's obviously a, a deeper uh, conversation to have at a different time, maybe. But one, of, I, I think I want to maybe conclude by just talking about maybe how Chesterton would interact with the modern world, because mm -hmm. he seems to have all these different opinions. Um, on uh, towards the rationalists and the people who who move into kind of uh, the hyper mysticism sort of sort of thing, and so um, our society right now seems to be in this in this weird position in which people are just like kind of moving to either end of those spectrums or kind of doubling down on their philosophical um, position in, in very interesting and weird ways. And it doesn't seem like anybody really agrees on anything. Um, mm -hmm. There's different groups here and there that have, have certain things that they agree on, but everybody's kind of <laughs> at war with each other. Uh, Austin, what, what do you, th how do you think Chesterton would interact with the modern age that we live in today through the lens of this book, Orthodoxy? Well, uh, it's interesting reading through it again, just how relevant it remains. I mean, if mm -hmm. you look at the names that are listed in Heretics, uh, the most famous person in there is H.G. Wells, and the second most famous is George Bernard Shaw, and nobody reads either of those people anymore. Um, <laughs> but people still read G.K. Chesterton. Um, but H.G. Sure. Wells yeah. and George Bernard Shaw are the ones that are supposed to be the apostles of progress and modernity and whatever is up to date. Mm -hmm. And so 
J.R.R. Tolkien quotes G.K. Chesterton more than um, basically any other modern author. And one of the quotes he says uh, that, that he brings sure. forward is, as soon as Chesterton, uh, Chesterton said, as soon as I have, see that anything is here to stay, then I immediately know that it's going to be irrelevant. Um, and so hmm. Chesterton remains relevant because he's not trying to be. He just sort of sticks his course and finds that he continues to have things to say because he is addressing not the fads and the fancies of passing social trends, but the real enduring elements of human nature uh, and, and mm -hmm. of our psychology. So what would he say to modern culture? Um, a lot of the things he is, is still saying. I mean, he predicted veganism for one thing. Uh, I, I got a laugh out of rereading this book talking about the vegetarians who say, well, it, it is now uh, unethical to eat animals and it might even in the future be unethical to eat milk and eggs. Uh, well, <laughs> he, he called that one. Um, but he, he is very concerned to talk about the way that the emperor of progress has no clothes. Um, that there is no such thing of what we mean by progress because nobody knows what it means to be a human being or what a human person is for. Um, mm -hmm. So he's trying to expose the fact that all of these people are talking about uh, words and terms and trends and fads, and it's actually a mask for not thinking at all. He's got a great passage here where he says, try to communicate what you believe in words of one syllable. Uh, you will find that it is uh, it, it is a great spur for thinking to try to remove all of the jargon uh, that that so clouds our current discourse. And I think that's really true in politics. We are um, motivated mostly by slogans and cliches, sure, and yeah. rather than actual substantive disagreements. Um, I think half of the country right now hates the other half and neither of us is really quite sure why uh, because we have allowed other things to substitute doing the thinking for us. So I think Chesterton would urge us to actually uh, focus and be clear about what we mean uh, and to stand by our convictions. Um, I think he would laugh at the fact that we're substituting technological advancement or anything else for um, – the things that have always been true of human nature, right? We, we're always going to want to get married to the people that we love. Um, cowardice is bad. Uh, courage is good. People need uh, something bigger than themselves in order to strive towards. Like these are fundamental impulses um, that are not going to go away. Uh, and it, it, yet at the same time, in order to have them, we have to acknowledge that there is something deeper than ourselves, something that's not just socially constructed or culturally um, rooted. It's it's something that's fundamental and universal. Um, and so I think he would push us back towards um, the idea that there is such a thing as a human nature in the first place. Um, and that is obviously going to directly contradict a lot of the people that think that human nature and gender and all of that stuff are just uh, socially constructed. Um, yeah, that's three things. Yeah, I know. It's almost, it's almost seems silly in some sense that Chesterton is just trying to remind us that well, there is a finite human nature. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's people. not silly. Yeah, right. It's be, people are the same uh, today as, as they were, you know, when they were first created. David, would you agree with uh, what Austin said? And would you add anything to that? Yeah, and I, I, I would firmly agree with all of that. I, I, I think that that point that uh, reason itself can only find its place in a bigger a bigger vision of things that are not de determined by reason or by the empirical scientific method or anything else, mm -hmm. I think is important. I mean, you brought up Richard Dawkins, uh, you know, he is now calling himself a cultural Christian. Um, I think he's been, I think he's been convinced to do that by people like his old friend, Ayan Hirsi Ali, who seems to be, uh, you know, now not just a cultural Christian, but, uh, but perhaps, uh, you know, she actually believes this stuff. Uh, but mm. Dawkins is realizing that, uh, in order to maintain this scientific culture that he thinks is so wonderful, um, it has to be in a context that's bigger than that. And I think Chesterton would have said, well, of course, you know, I, I, <laughs> I've told you so. And that's that's exactly what you need to keep following. Um, mm. There there has to be there has to be a bigger vision. And he would say to to the people who are now discovering that, you know, that's it's good that you're starting to see this. Now, let's talk about 
what a healthy form of the supernatural is versus an unhealthy and unnatural version of it. So I think he has he has a lot to say to our our neo pagans and to our uh, you know new atheists and all of the other the other uh, people who are running from running from that coherent vision of the world that's presented in Christianity, which takes up all the greatest things of the ancient world and the pagan world and the philosophers. Um, it's sort of torn these things apart. And Chesterton would say, there's a way to put them back together in a way that will make you sane and happy and humble mm-hmm. and and humorous. That's good. That's good. And I, mean, I want to ask one quick uh, question just before we before we end, because I think that it's something that I we, we didn't talk about much in this podcast, but... Um, Chesterton is this big personality. He's got a lot of, he's got opinions on things. He's not afraid to talk about what he believes in. Uh, but we live in an age in which on, uh, at least online, there's a lot of hostility when talking about ideas, whether it be political, theological, whatever it is. If you go on X for five minutes uh, and, and engage with the political world, you're like, it's, it's brutal. And even in the Christian world, it's brutal. And so on X and so, and in other social media platforms, the way that Chesterton seems to interact with ideas and and philosophies that he disagrees with seems to be a lot different than the way that a lot of us uh, do today, whether in the church or outside of the church. Um, what uh, what do you think is significant? And I'll start with Austin, we can end with David. Uh, what is significant about the way that Chesterton engages? Um, he seems to be light, very light, and, and doesn't take himself seriously. But why is that important? Or would you say that that's important? Yeah, I, I would. As you were talking, I think that the answer that popped into my head was laughter. He's able to laugh at it. Yeah. Um, because he recognizes that it it is important, but there are things that are more important still. And the fact is, George Bernard Shaw or any of these other people, the, the Blatchford that he's talking to, uh, he still has a love for them that goes over and above what their particular opinions are. Chesterton is able to separate the person from their perspective, uh, and he loves the person and he loves them enough to be able to treat them as a real individual uh, with agency and to say, you know, I disagree with you for X, Y, and Z reasons. Um, So he doesn't treat them as some sort of of an enemy, but he also doesn't treat them as some sort of an invalid who can't take criticism. Uh, You know, Chesterton wants other people to know the truth. He, he says that in orthodoxy. He's like, well, of course you think that your opinion is correct. Otherwise, it's not your opinion. Hmm. Um, and so <laughs> it's. I, I think that that's the secret is to put people first um, and to not reduce a person to their viewpoints. Um, now, how do we do that practically when we think that these issues are actually quite serious indeed? I mean, what do we do with people that are advocating for unrestricted abortion, for instance? Yeah, um, right. So how do we, if we're implementing policy, which I think is what most of this stuff is is revolving around on X nowadays, it seems to be all politics. Uh, yeah. If we're trying to shape policy, what does laughter have to do with it? Um, mm. But he, Chesterton's got this quote where he says um, that it's the freest people that are the ones that want to restrict themselves, um, that, that the ultimate freedom is the freedom to bind yourself to make laws. Uh, and he says, you'll find that a culture that's alive is the uh, is the culture that creates rules. Um, so when you, when you are sitting at the recess playground, you come up with a game, um, and that means that you're coming up with rules and restrictions um, by which you're going to govern your behavior. Hmm. Um, and so the restrictions that we have in this living society that Chesterton wants to envision is a restriction that's based in a positive thing, not in a negative thing. Um, hmm. You're attempting to create... Um, a goal that's worthwhile, something that everybody is united around. Um, this loyalty, the flag of the world, as is one of the chapters in Orthodoxy is called. Uh, so Chesterton has a positive vision of what human life is for, and it involves, you know, meat and potatoes and laughter and sunshine and love and uh, all sorts of football. Um, <laughs> he, he's not just a critic. Um, and so I think that if you can find enough people that are fighting for something rather than fighting against somebody else, um, the, they will be able to to laugh a little bit more and also to treat other people as uh, dignified opponents, perhaps. Hmm. Well, that's good. David, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, Chester, did, when he did politics, he could be pretty pretty hard to. I mean, he once said that, uh, you know, the problem with politicians these days is that not enough of them are hanged. 
Um, but, 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 you know, but it, with the exception of, of certain motions uh, like that, I mean, I think he was, generally speaking, as Austin said, capable of separating. And he, he says this in, in many of his works, that the chief thing that Christianity brings is that it, it takes the sword and cleaves the sin from the sinner, such that you can actually see the difference and see that human being there. Um, and, and that was something that he had uh, a marvelous ability uh, to do is to separate those things and to tell people directly that all of their principles are wrong, as he, as he did to Bernard Shaw and in Heretics and elsewhere. And many people loved him for that. Uh, you know, Wells uh, actually said that, uh, you know, if he, if he were to, if there were a heaven and he were to go, it would be based on his connection to, to G.K. Chesterton because he, he felt the love that was there. Um, and although some people, some of Chesterton's friends thought that he was a little too soft, the reality was that he saw that uh, the, the goal isn't necessarily just winning the argument, but it's actually winning over the arguer uh, to, to be able to make them see your side of things. And he thought that if they if they would make that choice to be open to the truth, then that might lead to the choice to embrace the truth. So that's why he was able to uh, to do things the way he did. Um, and he could be hard at times. But he liked to balance uh, that hardness also with a softness and a sense that uh, he loved people that could be that could be that could be uh, understood by the people that he was talking to. And, and we do need more of that. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Well, man, I feel like we could talk about uh we could talk about Chesterton all day and even this book, we barely scratched the surface, but I think, I hope it's a good uh, kind of inter introduction to certain people as they, as they listen, they might think that they should read it. I think that they should. Um, Austin and David, thanks so much for doing this. I appreciate it. Even though we had different technical issues, we ended up getting it done and hopefully we could do another one in the future on Chesterton. So thank you guys. Yeah. Sounds great. Always thank good you. to win the battle against technology. I think Chesterton would approve. <laughs>